with this sermon. And 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 to 9. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 to 9. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you. But they have rejected me from being king over them, according to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out, out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and receiving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. This is interesting because the Jewish people had a history of rejecting godly rule, rejecting God as their king. Notice that they had a choice. God had created uh, a situation in Israel where they did not have a king. They didn't have your normal government structure. How did they exist? How did they uh, coalesce as a group? And how did they govern themselves? Well, it was directly by God and the Torah, the book of the law. So they had no constitution. They had no man-made governmental functions that were set up. But Samuel was a prophet of God, and Samuel heard directly from the Lord. And he was God's mouthpiece to lead the people, just like Moses had done. The Bible, or the Torah, the Old Testament, was the way they were to know what God expected of them. And that was their governance. No Congress, no President. But they didn't like it that way. We've talked about this situation before. They didn't like it that way. They wanted to have someone ruling over them. They liked the flesh. They liked to have a strong man, a president, who's going to tell them what to do and lead them into battle and, and do all the things that other nations did. The problem was they weren't obeying God. They thought they could get more out of the situation by rebelling against God and His authority. It always comes down to this, that choice that we have to make. Will I put myself under God's authority, or will I rebel and seek my own form of leadership and ruling? This isn't the only time the Jews did this. If you'll remember, someone greater than Samuel came, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the true king. He came during the time of Pontius Pilate and the Roman rule over Israel. And the Jews again had another opportunity to find out which God, to declare which God they were going to follow, which king they would have rule over them. And they said very clearly, as Jesus had walked for three years doing many, many, many miracles, so many miracles, we don't even know the total number, healing the sick, Casting out devils, speaking the truth and the word of God, loving but also correcting and rebuking people, providing for people as a mouthpiece, as the actual person of God right in front of them. It's one thing to reject Samuel who speaks for God. It's another thing to reject God who's standing right in front of you, King of kings and Lord of lords. And they were given a choice by their own making. As they brought Jesus in front of Pilate, Pilate trembled. Now let's put this in perspective. The Roman governor over a conquered territory had absolute authority in that area, had soldiers under his control, could put to death anybody but a Roman citizen. And here is Pilate trembling in the face of Jesus, who had been mocked and persecuted. He, and, and was just thrown out like a rag. Why was he afraid of this man? Well, for many reasons, but one, the Holy Spirit spoke to his wife and said, have nothing to do with this man. He was scared. But more than that, in John 18, 33, 
So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Now why would he ask that question? Didn't he know that they had Herod and they had these other rulers? Because the Holy Spirit was speaking to him. No other way would he say, ask that question. He sees the man sitting in front of them and he sees their rejection of him. Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is from not from this world, not from the world. So Pilate then asked, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. He's believing Jesus. He's believing the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And not just what his eyes were seeing. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world. To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Are you listening to the voice of Jesus? Are you convicted that Jesus Christ is king? We have a choice to make, but the Jews had a choice, and they said no. As Pilate brought him out in fear, the Jews said no. We, our king is Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. They have no king but the king of this earth, the prince of this air. You know, to put yourself under the rulership, the kingship of Jesus, is a choice. The Jews chose unwisely. We still, to this day, have to make a choice about God. Do you know what was going on here? In both occasions, with Samuel and with Jesus, they, man was putting God on trial. And he was deciding whether or not he wanted God. The justice is not in man's hands. Judgment does not rest in man. But the choice of following the king does. That king that man tried to judge and rejected is the same judge, the same king that will judge mankind once and for all. Oh, we have had our chance to judge God. He has given us the opportunity to judge God. But that judgment is not going to be the final judgment. The final judgment is when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords Jesus. steps up onto the judgment bench and judges each one of us on that one decision. Is he your king? Or are you going to reject him? Now there is a process of rejection in John 19... Verse 1, starting with verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. He beat God. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out in front of all the people, came out after being beaten, mocked and bleeding with the silly crown on his head and the purple robe, making fun of God. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man! When the chief priest and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. But man, some men judged him guilty of nothing. They just said, kill him. We don't want him. We don't want your judgment. We don't want your rulership. We don't want to be a part of your kingdom. When we choose on a daily basis to follow Jesus as our king, when we choose unwisely, when we know who he is, but we just make a joke out of God. We just mock Jesus, and we do what we want to do. We don't want him to be a king over us. We want to be ruled by Caesar. We want to be ruled by ourselves or our flesh. 
It is the same way of this mocking of the soldiers against Jesus Christ. The silliness of the, of the reed and, the, and, the, and the, the silly crown they put on him. The beating that they gave him. Mocking God. You're telling, we are telling God, we don't want you in this part of my life to be king. A king has authority over his territory. And Jesus said, my territory is not of this world. His territory, his judgment, his authority is over you. When you come before the bench of salvation, did you, did you choose Christ? But also, for everything that we do, everything we do is held up to, to uh, evaluation of God's judgment. Do I want him to be my king? Mocking God. Many times, the authority of God is mocked. It isn't just Jesus. We saw the Jews mocking Samuel. Saying, we don't want you and we don't want your God to rule over us. You see this in families and churches as well. We'll see there is a proper order that God gave. There is authority in God's kingdom. There is authority in the church. There is authority in the family. And God said, this is the way you'll run in my kingdom. The woman will respect her husband. The husband will love the wife. And the children will honor their parents. Amen. And in the church, there is a respect of authority. There is a respect for communicating truth. We see that God, uh, Paul told Timothy, you know, don't hold back the rebuke and correction that is necessary to bring people into the right alignment with God. Do not hold back. There is authority, but it is of another world. Mocking Jesus. Hail, King of the Jews. How many times have we said, oh, I'm a Christian, and then we go off and we do whatever we want? Mocking Jesus. Mocking the king. And what about all the sins we commit? And we don't care about it. We know the word of God, but we aren't applying it to our life. If you say he's your king, he must rule over your life, must rule <coughs> over your family, he must rule over your decisions. There's one great thing that God shows us in abundance. When he died as our king, he died to bring forgiveness of sins to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. He died to set us free from all of our sins. That was his greatest triumph and judgment as king. But the problem is, as much as we admire, respect, and appreciate that. That love and grace and forgiveness of God. We are so small. Because we hold judgments against our brothers and sisters. There is unforgiveness, even in this church. It's mocking God. When you think you can hold anger, unforgiveness, and bitterness in your heart. There's a story that the Lord tells us about. A man that owed the king 10,000 talents, a, a lot of money, and he couldn't pay back. And the king forgave him. As the man came humbly before him, he forgave him instead of putting his whole family in a debtor's prison. But what did that servant do? There was a man who just owed him a few coins, yeah. a few coins, and he forced that man. He held him up and judged him and said, you've got to pay me back. And when the king found out, he said, ah, you don't understand. You know, Matthew 18, 27. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and gave them him the debt. That was, that was the king giving him freedom. But then, if we look down to verse 35, or excuse me, let's go down to 33 to 35 in Matthew 18. 
And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant, as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. What do we learn from this? Well, God will forgive all your sins but one. Isn't he saying that if you are not able to forgive other people, you will be held in judgment? Hypocrites. If we go back earlier in Matthew 18, verse 21, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? That's a lot. 22nd verse, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. And that's when we get into that story. What is Jesus saying? The number seven is completeness of God. Seven. Seven days. The day of rest. The day of completeness of the creation of all that God made. He doesn't just say seven times, which is perfect. He says Forgive him 77 times. Infinity times infinity. Yeah. And who are we to hold judgments against our brothers and sisters? Who are we not to forgive them? Complete, utter, total forgiveness. That's what you have. That's who your king is. When he says, when he tells us to forgive our brothers 77 times, he's saying, I have forgiven you. 77 times. I have given you complete forgiveness. Amen. But where is your pitiful little forgiveness to the one that might have harmed you or done something wrong to you? If you want to be in the debtor's prison, you will not forgive him. And that is God who sends you there, not someone else. Perfect forgiveness. Hallelujah. That's what you have. That's what I have. Have we forgotten this? Have we have forgotten the perfection of our king? Have we forgotten that he is a king and his law is binding upon all of us? If it's not, we're all going to hell. If he doesn't keep his promises, if he doesn't keep his own commandments, what kind of a God do we have? If God has commanded me in perfection like that, I must also return that. It is the rule of the kingdom of God. Utter and complete perfection. If we say we don't forgive our brothers, if we say we have no repentance, there's no sin that we need to confess, we have denied Jesus, we have put the crown of thorns on his head, we have mocked him and made him out to be a silly caricature that we call Christ. And God is not just a theology. God is not just some word we use. God is a king. God is authority. God has my life in his hands. God is beautiful, majestic, powerful. Who is your king? Is he the king of the Jews? Is he the king of you? Is he the king of me? My king is king of kings. Jesus. My king is Lord of lords. My king is God of righteousness. My king is perfect. My king forgives. My king loves. My king gives me an inheritance. My king gives me eternity. My king gives me truth. My king heals my body. My king gives me resurrection power. My king! Amen. Is he your king? Is he king of ICF? Is he king yes. of the Jews? Is he king over your heart? And what you say and what you think. Amazing. Sometimes we feel so trapped in our sins and darkness and oppression. But the ultimate thing about our king is choice. Is he your king? You can choose whatever you want. You can choose whatever kingdom you want to live in. You can choose this kingdom on earth where there's oppression and judgment and there is unforgiveness and hatred and lust and rebellion and all of the other sins of man. Or you can choose him as your king. And choosing him as your king means I'm going to live in his kingdom. I'm going to live under his rules. I'm going to forgive my brother. I'm going to live in righteousness. I'm going to look for the good and I am going to... Follow my king until my death. Amen. My king. When in the old days, when someone committed themselves to the king, they committed everything. The cupbearer. 
We've seen that example. The cupbearer was to drink the, the whatever drink or wine that the king was going to take. He's making an oath. Why did he have to drink it? Because someone might poison the king. The person that bears the king's cup is saying, I will give my life for the king. Jesus. Yeah. Can you drink this cup? Will you be the cupbearer of Jesus Christ? Is he your king? Would you die for your king? Would you surrender everything to your king? And that we are even told by Paul, he says, this is a horrible thing going on in your church. You're suing each other. And oh, yes, you have disagreements with one another. But instead of resolving them here, under the authority of God and the authority of the church, and the judgment where the Holy Spirit is present, you're taking them to judge duty. You're taking them out into the secular court, and you're trying them. Maybe you go to your secular friends. Maybe you go, be, go outside the system of God, the courts of God, and you try that person in judgment. Whether it's someone who's a Christian or not, you talk about them. You hang them. You hang them in guilt and shame, and you will not release them because you did not bring them into the court of God. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, under the authority of the Word of God, it is just your choice. To hang somebody. And he says, wouldn't it be better if you just let your brother wrong you? If your brother took your Bible, like I remember somebody had accused someone of doing. Just let him have the Bible. If someone has not Maybe they took food out of your house or a little plastic bag and they didn't bring it back. That's something like this. Let it go. You're going to hold them in judgment? Someone forgot to return something to you? Someone accidentally said something you didn't like? He says, let it go. Who are you? Who are you to judge? What has he done for us? Psalm 103, 10. Psalm 103.10, God, he, does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Verse 17, But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. He has forgiven you. He has forgiven me. But lest we forgive one another. You want to have everything go out the window. Walk around in bitterness and unforgiveness. And judge your brother. And fail to release him or her. Judgment. How many times do you have conversations negatively holding the other person accountable for their actions. But what if you have an opportunity for one of your sins? Will you go to that brother and say, please forgive me? I know I have to do that. And many people don't return that to me, even though I realized that I had some partial responsibility in the problem. I have asked for forgiveness, and many times I know the other person also was wrong, but they never came forward and said, please forgive me. Are they holding me in judgment, unable to release their own wrongdoing? The Bible tells us to first judge ourselves. It's better to judge ourselves than to wait to the judgment day and have God judge you. Complete forgiveness. Oh, there's something else that happens when we don't forgive. Forgiveness is a seed. And as that seed begins to grow, it penetrates into the earth and it becomes a root. And the Bible refers to that root as bitterness. Bitterness. 
Something that happened to you 20, 30, some of you were very young, <laughs> days ago. <laughs> Others, it's years. Others, it's months. Oh, I remember when so-and-so did this. I remember and when you have an argument and that flares out and it comes out of your mouth and out of your heart. Years later, that is a root of bitterness. Don't put yourself in denial to think that you cannot have this bitterness. What does bitterness do? It grows. It's deep. And it corrupts even Christians. It corrupts our understanding of people and God. And all of a sudden, you may have been a spirit-filled believer, filled with the Holy Spirit, good in good prophetic words. And now when bitterness comes in, you have another spirit, and it corrupts your prophetic gift. It'll corrupt a pastor. It'll corrupt any one of us. It'll corrupt a husband or a wife. Bitterness. It'll corrupt a child towards their parents. Bitterness. And it grows deeper and deeper and deeper. And if you don't get it out, if you don't repent, if you don't confess, it'll kill you. It is not a root that brings life. It's a root that brings death. It's like poison ivy growing up in your garden. There was a man named Simon. And he had made money over doing magic tricks in Samaria. But when Philip came and the, and the revival broke out there, people were getting saved and the Holy Spirit was moving with tremendous power. And Simon saw this and he, they realized, everybody realized that Simon was just a magician before, but now they see the real power of God. Demons were coming out. People were getting healed. People were falling to their knees, convic convicted of sin and accepting Jesus. And when he saw that the laying on of hands released the Holy Spirit into people, he wanted it. But he had already accepted Jesus. Simon had already accepted Jesus. But there was something wrong with Simon. And in verse uh, Acts 8.18, 8, it says, Acts 8.18, 8, down to 24. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because your thought, you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Peter could see right into his heart. There's a problem in the heart. It looked like he was zealous for God. He just wanted the Holy Spirit. He just didn't understand things. So he's off offering money. But he was really corrupted down to the root. And he was under judgment of God. And he said, what you need is not more of the Holy Spirit. You don't need to be going out praying for more people or doing more miracles. What you need to do is repent. You need to get that root out or some judgment shall come upon you. When we have the root of bitterness, it corrupts the Holy Spirit. You will find that you are not witnessing as often as you used to to people. You will find that the miracles are slowing down. You will find that the joy and flow of the Holy Spirit in your community, in your assembly, in your church, in your house, it's not flowing like it once was. Instead, your negativity is focused on individuals, and all you think about night and day is how bad this pastor is, how bad that person is, how bad my parents are, how bad my husband is. That is the root of bitterness. And the Holy Spirit will not, not, Fill you up in that condition. You will not be bringing forth a good spirit. You'll be bringing forth a bad spirit of condemnation, negativity. And many times there is pride involved in that. Many times there is gossip involved in that. If you want the Holy Spirit, surrender and repent. And ask the Lord to take away, as Simon did, pray for me, not the other guy. Don't worry about her or him. Pray for me. To the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Nothing improved in my relationship with my mother until I confessed my sin to her. 
Regardless, I had a long history. I could have brought up every negative thing she ever did to me. And in the years past, I used to think about that, and it would cause me depression. But when I realized that I was wrong to my mother, and that I was not forgiving her, and I confessed that to her, and asked her forgiveness, and the tears flowed out of her eyes, and our relationship was healed, and she accepted Jesus, and was baptized, and delivered, I didn't have to get her to admit everything she did to me to ask her forgiveness for what I had done to her. But because my king is Jesus, and I choose to follow his kingdom rules, I chose, as Paul said, let them have it. If they took something from you, let them keep it. Press on. Don't bring them into the court. Don't keep judging them over and over again. Let it go. Let the bitterness go. Let love flow. Let forgiveness come. Because you know what? All of a sudden, when you have the root of bitterness, you'll start spreading it. That, that root starts to grow through your garden, and it affects all the other plants, and it drains all the energy, and the flowers aren't so pretty anymore around you. And you keep looking at them and saying, wow, look, they're dying. They're all dead. Well, maybe you killed them. Maybe your bitterness went under the ground, hidden deep underneath, and it touched the other ones and strangled the life out of them, and you made them angry. And then you look at them and say, look at that person. He's angry. She's angry. Yeah. Maybe your root of bitterness touched it off in them. And you know what? They have to stop and say, whoa, I'm not falling into that trap. Amen. Amen. I don't want it. The gall of bitterness kills ministries. The gall of bitterness kills marriages. The gall of bitterness kills all relationships. You know, you can look like a wonderful person on the surface doing good deeds for God, talking about Jesus. But if you have a root underneath the surface that has not been dealt with, you are bringing death and destruction. You are bringing rebellion. The Jews were under gall of bitterness when they rejected Jesus and Samuel. That was not helpful to the kingdom of God. It destroyed the authority of God. We don't want Simons. We don't want to be Simons. They destroy churches, families, and relationships. Uh, but the good thing about Jesus is his ability to forgive us. And he's teaching us as our king to forgive others. Isn't he? What are you learning from Jesus? What are you learning from your king? Is it hatred and anger? Is it unforgiveness? Is it rebellion? Well, that's the wrong king. You're in the wrong kingdom. Your king. Love, forgiveness, patience, kindness, gentleness. My king, my king, my king. Yes. And he says in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. If I said I forgave you, I forgive you. Amen. His judgments don't pass away. Let us fix the helmet of salvation onto our heads and know where that comes from. We have the, the helmet on our head to protect us from the attacks of the enemy. Those negative thoughts that are coming into your mind that is of bitterness, anger, negativity, unforgiveness. Put the helmet of salvation on because that helmet protects your head from the lies of the devil. And that helmet costs us our God, our King, something that cost him his life. He was suffering to give you that helmet of salvation, that protection to become your King, to make himself available to you to be your King. You were once in prison to Satan. There was a time in your life when you had unforgiveness and bitterness and you could do nothing about it, it just kept going over and over again. You had lust, you could do nothing about it. You had anger, you could do nothing about it. Just kept you in control. And then Jesus comes along and you have a choice on that day. Are you going to follow Caesar or are you going to follow the King Jesus? Is he your king? And you said yes. But you've been listening to some bad voices. Maybe you never got that root out. 
and it's still in there. But Paul says, such were some of you. You used to be an adulteress. You used to be a, a, a fornicator. You used to be a, a rebellious person. You used to be an angry person. You used to be this or that. But he says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Do not, do not choose to be dominated by bitterness. Do not choose to be dominated by rebelliousness, witchcraft, control. Do not choose to be dominated by hatred, by fear. Do not choose to be dominated by lust. Do not choose to be dominated by a spirit of stupor, a spirit of doubt. Your choice. You have a choice. Your greatest freedom, and that's what I was worshiping today. The revelation was connecting with this word that I have for you today. That heaviness you have on your heart, you have a choice to get rid of it. Don't blame a demon. There might be a demon in there, but you can get rid of him. When you choose to put yourself under the authority of your king. Jesus. Do you understand? Yes. That's why people come back time after time with the same demons, even after you've delivered them. Because they have not chosen Christ as their king in that part of their life. They are still letting that other king rule. Yeah. And once you say, you say, why do I feel so depressed, so heavy, so downbeat? It's right here. Put on the helmet of salvation. Amen. Which is grace, forgiveness, and love. 77 times. Perfection times perfection. And you choose. I have been a slave to this thing. This is a lie. My prison door has no lock on it. Did you know that? Your prison door in whatever you're suffering from, whatever sin, whatever anger, unforgiveness, you can open that door today and you can push it open and that devil will not be lying to you anymore. You choose your own freedom. Hallelujah. Choose it. You don't like your lust? Choose not to walk in the lust. Choose to walk in the freedom of God. You don't like being hate, have this hateful, unhappy feeling? Choose to let it go today. Kick the door open. Nobody's making you stay there. You're a child of God. Amen. It's your choice to follow him or not. And we get back to that. Man tries God. Man judges God when you do your own thing. You said, this rule doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. I'm king of my own rules. I'm walking my own way. Mm -hmm. Choose God. Forgive, love, let it go. Mm -hmm. Acts 17, 30 to 32. Acts 17, 30 to 32. <laughs> the time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. You and I have judged God, and now it's going to be his turn. When the final curtain is over, when we have died, when we have been called up to the judgment seat, and he is going to judge us, did you forgive when I told you to forgive? Fix the day for all of us. And notice how some mocked. You don't think you're mocking God, but you are when you deny what he's told you to do. When you don't take it seriously. When you don't think the rule applies to you, but it applies to everybody else. You are mocking God. You are not saying, King, whatever you say, whatever you want, that's what I will do. I surrender myself to you. Well, I can pray for people today, but you need to decide today, yourself. Who's your God? Who's your king? If you want to stay in prison of anger and unforgiveness, if you want to stay in the problems in your family and your life, and the door is unlocked, and all you have to do is kick it and walk out. That's not my job to pray for you. It is your job. 
It's your job. If you have fear, if you have lust, if you have anger, whatever it is, kick the door open yourself and walk out. If you have Jesus as your Savior, you have power over that sin in your life. Let it go. We can pray to help you, but you've got to make that decision. Today, I don't want anybody coming up here condemning somebody else. If you have a problem, you come up, you repent of whatever is going on in your life. Don't talk about somebody else's. Your life. Put it under the authority of Christ. And I'll pray for you, but nothing else, nothing else.